All right, good morning, everyone. We hope you are doing well on this April Fool's Day. Um, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, and it looks like we are off to a better start than last time, Jeremy. We have a few more than just our moms, and while we appreciate them watching, it's great to have everyone else joining us as well. Um, so it is April Fool's Day, and while I am not a good prankster because I can't keep a secret or tell a lie to save my life, um, and for those of you that know me, know my face turns all kinds of funky shapes when I attempt to do that, <laughs> there are some wildlife in New Mexico that are much better at playing jokes than I am. So Jeremy, tell us a little bit about some of these jokesters that really aren't a joke. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, a little change of plans. Um... You know, April Fool's Day is kind of the obvious approach. Um, instead, I'd, I'd really like to talk about uh, tax season. Um, that's, 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 you know, on everybody's mind. So I've, I've really distilled down here uh, everything you need to know, forms, uh, facts and stuff, into a, just a brief two-hour presentation. Um, grab some paper, take some notes. If you have a graphing calculator, that might help, but it's not necessary. Of course, I'm kidding, folks. We're not doing anything about taxes. We are talking about animal tricksters, behavior in New Mexico animal species that could be perceived as them uh, tricking another species in honor of April Fool's Day. So let's get into it. So everybody knows uh, that monarch butterflies have a mimic. Uh, so monarch butterflies lay their eggs and the caterpillars hatch out. And, and eat milkweed. They rely on milkweed as their host plant. And this milkweed being poisonous gives the monarch butterfly an advantage because they then taste poisonous. And these bright colors, usually bright oranges and bright yellows in the animal world are usually warning colors. Um, and they're, they're telling predators, you're, you're not gonna wanna eat me, I'll make you sick, or I might kill you, that kind of thing. The thing is though, that's not a monarch butterfly. This is. This is its lookalike called the viceroy. And this is called mimicry, when one species resembles another one. Now, for, for many years, it was thought that the viceroy was a palatable species that could be eaten by, by predators, and the monarch was the bad tasting one that was being mimicked. And, and that type of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry, when one is harmless and one is dangerous or bad tasting. However, recent research has, has shown that the viceroy, uh, its host plant is willow trees, and it makes it bitter tasting, maybe to the level of monarch butterflies. So viceroys in their own right might be foul tasting, and so it might be more like what we call Mullerian mimicry. What about other species? Oh, uh, one more thing before we, we go off there. Uh, if you're curious, look at that circled portion of the viceroy's wing, and you'll see that the, the, the cells in the wing are divided into like kind of two stories by a line in the middle of that circle. And then look at the monarch, and it does not have that. That's how you tell the difference. If you're a hungry butterfly eater, other species that look similar. Tristana's favorite, snakes. So here we have two red, yellow, and black snakes, okay? And maybe you've heard the expression. If not, you should learn it today. Red touches yellow, kill a fellow. Red touches black, venom lack. And what that's referring to is the, the bands and their adjacent colors in the snake. So if we look at the red bands in this top species, they are right next to black bands. Well, that goes to the top part of this, this expression, red touches black, venom black. This is a harmless species. If we come down to this bottom species, its red bands are directly adjacent to thin, but still there, yellow bands. So the red touches the yellow. This is a venomous species. Uh, and in fact, this is a New Mexico milk snake, and they're harmless to people. And this is a Western coral snake. It's our only representative of the cobra family. It's a venomous species. This being the harmless mimic and the other one being a danger to people. So that's Batesian mimicry. 
everyone knows about something plain possum. Virginia opossum is a more correct name, uh, but why is, is, is that advantageous? Why is that behavior to play dead helping this species? Well, if you're a predator and you see a prey item in front of you acting strange, uh, maybe smelling bad or acting like it's diseased or uh, ill or even poisoned, you don't wanna eat that because it could in turn kill you or injure you. So that's why playing dead works sometimes. But everybody knows about the possum. Let's talk about another species that plays dead. Right here in New Mexico, we have a, a smaller, small to medium sized snake called a Western hognose snake. This snake gets its name from that enlarged upturned scales on its rostrum on its nose that make it look like a snout or a pig's nose. It's called a hognose snake. Um, they like they like to eat frogs and toads and some lizards and some other things, but they can be very picky about eating frogs and toads. When sometimes when this snake species feels threatened, not always, but sometimes they will play dead too. They will flip over onto their back, and they will become stiff and rigid, like rigor mortis has set in, and they'll flatten their belly scales like you see there, and they'll hold their mouth open in kind of like a death pose that they they died in agony or something like that um, and that's to fool a predator to make them think twice and there's the hognose snakes are so committed to this performance that if you were to grab one and ride it flip it back over it would know to flip itself back over in front of you because it knows that it, its belly needs to be in the air for its its best its best death looking performance very committed have you ever seen a little inland shorebird that looks like this? Uh, this is called a killdeer. Really strange name, but someone thought that its call sounded like the words kill and deer, but very strange. Anyway, uh, killdeers nest on, nest on the ground and they give the, the, the eggs hatch into these little puff balls that you see there. Um, and the, the killdeer mothers have a pretty cool trick up their sleeves to defend their babies. If you were to get near a killdeer nest or a killdeer baby, the, the mother bird is going to hold her wing at a really weird angle that makes it look like it's broken. And she's gonna fan out her feathers to make it look kind of mussed up or messy. And she's gonna drag that wing along the ground, keeping an eye on you and getting close to you and calling. Uh, and that's to lure a predator or a perceived threat like a person walking in a park away from her nest or her babies um, with the idea being that an injured animal is easier pickings for a predator. So she's acting injured and trying to protect her young. Pretty cool. Here is a, a really big, beautiful moth species. If you think moths can be beautiful, I can. Um, called the luna moth and you can see these in new mexico they're they're a large moth you know like maybe a, a hand's breadth across and i hope what you see in their pattern there or lack thereof it's a pretty simple uh, wing but it has what we call eye spots on it and these look like exactly what the name describes looks like a set of eyes looking at you the idea the idea here is that predators don't want to attack their prey head on. They want to use surprise and they want to attack you from behind. So if this moth can give some bird or some other predator, uh, you know, second thoughts about attacking it because it looks like an animal's watching it and it's not sure what that is, then that's advantageous for the animal to, to the butterfly to keep living. And if I zoom in on it, you can see that not only are they, they nice round eyes, but it looks like they have a pupil and it even looks like they have an eyelid above them or maybe even eyebrows. Pretty neat, but that's crazy stuff, right? Um, that's, that's in the animal world. People don't do that, except that we do, we do. Now the science is out on this, but uh, some people believe that you can put fake eyes on the back of your head, on your bicycle helmet, on your beanie hat, on your baseball cap, and this might deter 
mountain lion attack. Again, mountain lions want to attack you from behind and they want to do it in secrecy and in stealth. So the idea is that maybe, just maybe, these fake eyes will make the mountain lion think twice that you're watching it. Pretty cool. Gray squirrels have a behavior to kind of protect their hard work. They trick other people. So if a gray squirrel thinks that it's being watched, it will go about hiding its acorns in the ground, but it won't actually put them there. It will fake hide its food if it thinks it's being observed. Um, it might do this two or three times before the actual food item gets placed in the ground in case other squirrels are watching it or other birds. It's tricking you. Back to the bird world. This is a green heron. Green herons can eat whatever they get their hands on. They might eat small snakes or frogs or toads or insects, um, mice if they happen to come across it, but they, lie, they love fish. They want to do a lot of fishing, and that's what you see this one doing perched over the water. But green herons do something pretty neat. They have been observed taking an item and dropping it on the surface of the water to lure fish to come to that item. So they are fishing just like you or I would, or you could say that they're using a tool. So the next time somebody calls you a bird brain, take it as a compliment, they're not that dumb. Here are some still images of a green heron. And I know they're kind of grainy because they're from a video and you can feel free to go check this out on the web, it's there. This green heron has a piece of bread in its bill. And you might think, oh, it's feeding birds in the park, you know, it's gonna eat that bread, but it doesn't. It places the bread in the water and it kind of lets it float out a little bit and it's watching that bread, it's using it, it's playing a trick. And as it sees a fish approaching the bread, it grabs it. I hope you can see the fish's mouth there. So here's a bird using a tool. Pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. Maybe one of the biggest tricksters uh, in our state in terms of wildlife species might be, be somewhere on the list to be sure, it might be the brown-headed cowbird. A super imaginative, creative name, huh? It's a cowbird with a brown head. The male is on the right. It has shiny black feathers, brown head. The female is on the left there, more drab so she can hide. The brown-headed cowbird is on our trickster list because it lays its eggs in another species nest. And this is called nest parasitism. Other species do this too, like uh, for instance, the yellow-billed cuckoo will lay its eggs in another species nest. So you can see the advantage of that. Someone else has to raise your kids. The disadvantages to the foster parents um, are that the brown-headed chicks are often a lot larger than the chicks of the species that belong in that nest. So you can imagine if there's a larger chick and it's louder and it's taller in the nest, it gets fed more. And that has spelled a lot of problems for some of our songbirds. Here you see a brown-headed cowbird chick dwarfing its foster warbler parent. So that's that's pretty that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty big trick there. That's pretty elaborate, <laughs> having someone else raise your kids in secret. Um, so I hope you're wondering before we wrap up. Well, then, if brown-headed cowbirds get raised by other species, how do they learn to be brown-headed cowbirds? How do they learn the songs and the behavior? How do we just not run out of brown-headed cowbirds? It's a good question. I decided to include it for the curious. So in lab settings, when the bird can't leave and everything is enclosed, that's exactly what happens. The brown-headed cowbirds learn to behave like their foster parents. But in the wild, most go on to behave like brown-headed cowbirds and continue that species. So what is going on? Well, some researchers found out that when the brown-headed cowbirds reach, you know, like teenage, uh, that's about 20 or 25 days old, they somehow instinctually know to sneak off at night to some place they've never been 
to meet up with other brown-headed cowbird adults. So leave it to a teenager to sneak off in the middle of the night, right? Um, and it's thought that adult brown-headed cowbirds, because they roost together, this might be instinctually attracting the young. This species also has an affinity for fields, grassland and open fields. And that coupled with the roosting together and the cacophony of them calling together might instinctually attract these birds so that they go hang out with their own kind. And that's how they learn brown-headed cowbird calls and behavior and mate with other brown-headed cowbirds. That's all I have today for a special edition of Wildlife Facts Fast on April Fool's Day. If you've enjoyed the performance, uh, I've been Jeremy Lane. If you have not, my name is Ross Morgan. <laughs> nice. So thank you, Jeremy, for filling us in on some wildlife jokesters out there. And we want to hear from all of you. So what wildlife do you know that can play pranks on other wildlife or on people? So go ahead and put those in the comments. And we also want to know what wildlife jokes you're playing on your family today. So make those comments below. But thank you all very much. And join us again soon for the next edition of Wildlife Facts Fast. Bye, everybody. Don't buy any bridges today. <laughs>